Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is called Ops Help. NASA needs a chase. Now by ops, I mean current operations, the command post. That was my job out there. I was the officer in charge of that. And uh, NASA Dryden out there, it's, it's now NASA Armstrong. The thing is, you know, you get your name on a, a facility or building and it stays there, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like various airports and stuff. Your name stays there until somebody more important comes along and kind of moves you aside. That's kind of the way life works, but I digress. Anyway, okay, uh, NASA in its own right, they were the elite boys out there, the elite group. Uh, they were head and shoulders above the other operations out there. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you kind of an example of this, because this was kind of a, a, a cool little incident that happened in the late seventies when I was uh, um, in charge of the command post out there. But first, let me give you a little history. Now, this is the historic flight test sign that uh, is in the right stuff and all that. And it was still up there in the 70s. It's been replaced with a more modern sign. And this one's in the museum now. But when I drove on to Edwards, this was the historic sign. Uh, really cool sign in the movie, stuff like that. But let's talk about the command post. Now, we use those kind of interchangeably, current ops, the command post, and that. Now, uh, this is a later picture. When I was there, we didn't have the airplanes on the stick or that. It was a lot more um, plain, but um, the command post is up in this building. At least it was at the time. They redone some stuff. I'm not actually sure where it's located now, but it, at the time, it was in this building. Uh, the uh, center commander, the general's office, was a few doors down um, as you face the room to the right. The wing commander was a few doors down as you face the room to the left. And um, it was it's the nerve center of the operation out there. And if anything uh, unusual is going on, uh, those two guys could come right down into that office very quickly. So uh, now here's what we basically did. Okay, the uh, the schedulers would come up with a schedule for the day. Okay, at 8 o'clock, the B-1's going to fly. At 10 o'clock, the F-15's going to fly. At noon, the F-16's going to fly. And these people would have range support. They would have uh, uh, telemetry, uh, sport tracking support. Uh, they would have chase support. They would have facilities uh, support, all this stuff. And, you know, like things work, you know, you do this wonderful schedule together. And then the day starts. And, that, and that's where uh, I came in because my job, was to juggle the balls because uh, first of all, it's not like an airliner uh, or an airline. You know, things go wrong on airlines as it is, uh, you know, just with that operation. But you go out into the test area and, you know, you're always having slips due to uh, maintenance problems. You got a telemetry problem with the aircraft. You got a maintenance problem, stuff like that. So things start slipping. And that's where my job comes in because basically, um, you know, if the B1 starts to slip and at the time it was the highest uh, uh important aircraft it had priority number one so if it starts to slip in the f-15 well that's too bad for the f-15 but my job was to keep things working on a minute by minute basis so i would work with the f-15 people to reschedule their operation coordinate everything and um, we had a, a phone bank and i had a headset and i had hotline buttons to all the joint test force to the tower uh to the fire department hospital um everywhere and uh, it, it was kind of cool. You, you press the button and they have a dedicated phone and they answer within seconds. And, you know, if we'd start to have a problem, I, I interfaced as a first lieutenant. I later became, uh, you know, a captain shortly thereafter. But I started out as first lieutenant. I met uh, inter, uh, interfacing with full bird colonels who were the Joint Test Force Commander Experience Test Pilots. And, um, you know, telling them that, I, I'm sorry, sir, but your mission is slipping and we're trying to rearrange it and stuff like that. Well, um, I represented the wing commander in this because he was the overall authority. But, uh, you know, we had procedures and protocol, and if I screwed up, boom, I'm out there. I, I got to do everything right. And once in a while, we'd get into a situation where we'd have an emergency or something like that, and the... Uh, um, the, the general or the wing commander would come in. They usually were in the back of the room and they, uh, at least in my case, they, they never intervened. They just let me operate. And that was, that was kind of interesting. But, um, the two people who had the job before me, both majors, um, unfortunately they screwed up and they were both fired. But anyway, okay. That sets the story about how we operated with a phone bank and stuff like that. And how, you know, we were the important nerve center. And when we picked up the phone and punched the button, people responded right away. 
Now, this is the Dryden Center at the time. It's got that nice X1E up there that uh, Chuck Yeager flew. And at the time, my contact over there at the main kind of scheduling uh, center there uh, was a lady named Betty. And Betty was a very nice lady, and we had a very nice relationship. And uh, I, I would help things work uh, for NASA test programs and stuff like that. And uh, we just we just worked very well together, as, as did most of the people that I worked with at the Joint Test Forces and the other places. Now, um, probably that might have been why I got to fly the F-104. I think Betty probably was instrumental in that. And, of course, I knew the, I knew the various uh, test pilots out there, uh, shuttle astronauts who were flying out there and stuff like that. And we were on a, you know, a good relationship, so that was nice. And I got to fly the 104. And, oh, is that an amazing aircraft? I've got a few uh, videos on that. But they had this test mission. And the test mission was their B-52, a C model, no flaps. Now, I don't know much about B-52s. I've never flown one. Uh, but I do know that an aircraft that big that doesn't have flaps, and uh, the, one of the reasons they used this was because uh, the, the flaps, they had a cutout as it was in the, uh, in the uh, wing area for the tail of the X-15. I mean, that's how far back Balls 8, which was their aircraft, goes. Uh, it carried the X-15. It carried a lot of stuff. But this program was uh, testing the recovery parachutes on the shuttle SRB, the solid uh, refusable boosters. They, they weighed, um, I think, 55,000 pounds at least. That was the weight of the blivet they were using. They called this big heavy thing a blivet. That's a NASA term, I guess or whatever but anyway uh, they were testing these parachutes and <clears throat> this device is held uh, by these little latches kind of like fingers up there and they were going down uh, to China Lake and I'll kind of show you that situation in just a minute and they're going to drop this thing well there's a little bit of a, of a problem down there uh, with China uh, with with the the dropping of it they went and they they did the normal release and the fingers came back a little bit Okay, that's not good. Well, they go to the backup system. The fingers come back a little bit more. Okay, you got a problem here. You've got a 55,000 pound object that's being held essentially by fingertips on your wing and you can't get rid of it. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, and they worked and worked on trying to release it. And the, the problem uh, got to the point where um, they were running uh, low on fuel. Now, the aircraft that they used uh, for chasing uh, were F-104s. This is the NASA F-104, the one, the, the type I got to fly. And um, uh, it's the chase aircraft, and it's running low on gas. So I get a call from the test aircraft saying, hey, we need another chase. Now, this is the test section, uh, the restricted area down by El Centro, which was really close to the Mexican border. It is one of the places we could drop things. We did a lot of the, um, especially since it was kind of a Navy base, uh, we did a lot of the Navy F-18 ejection seat tests down there. I'd go down there a lot uh, to chase it, but it was a, a large area where you could drop things. We had a number of areas where you could drop things, but this is one, and this is the one that NASA uh, scheduled uh, to drop uh, the Blivet down southeast of Edwards. All right, so the B-52 with the F-104 chase, they're down by that green arrow there, down uh, uh, by the Salton Sea. And it was kind of interesting, a little side note here. We had F-111s, they always fueled the aircraft up full, and I guess they were too heavy to land, so they would tend to go down the Salton Sea, they'd, they'd dump the excess fuel, and then they'd go into afterburner, which would light it off, and you get this huge, long flame. And that, that was kind of okay until somebody called up the base and said, hey, one of your airplanes exploded, because it looked like it had exploded with that huge fireball behind it. But anyway, I think they might have put a little damper on that. But uh, this is where they were. Now, the yellow arrow is Edwards up there, and <clears throat> that's where we're based at, and the R-2508 uh, complex. So, uh, I get the call that they're running, uh, they're running low on gas and they need another chase. Now, that main long runway down there uh, is the Edwards main runway, and NASA is all the way up at the top. And I call Betty and I said, hey, uh, uh, the, the mission is having a problem. They can't release it. Their, their chase is running low on gas. They need another chase. Well, uh, they were going to come back and they were going to land at Edwards and they needed a chase, of course, to, uh, to support them. Now, I pick up the phone and I call Betty and I tell her that. And five minutes later, 
they call for taxi because everything had to go through uh, the current operations. Everybody had to call for taxi uh, to, to start moving. That was part of the security and control, stuff like that. So, okay, can you imagine uh, uh, Mankey was the pilot. He was the head of uh, Dryden Flight Test at the time. He's in his normal clothing, and he goes down there, and in five minutes... He is calling for taxi. He's rolling. And of course, at, at this time, I had picked up the hotline to the tower and I said, hey, we got a problem here. NASA is going to be calling shortly uh, for taxi. Give them priority, uh, number one for takeoff. And of course, that was the kind of authority that the command post had. And that's that's what they would do to accommodate. Uh, everybody was, was was very accommodating. So, I mean, five minutes later, he's calling for taxi. Uh, that's 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 how impressive NASA can be. And okay, he's up, he's going, and he's going down there, and the the chase is coming back, and he uh, rendezvous with the uh, the B fifty two, and this is a uh, this is a uh, balls eight. You see the zero zero eight. That's why they called it. Uh, this wasn't the blivet there. It's carrying something else. But okay, he's going to come in and land, and. Well, he could have done a lake bed, but the lake bed can be a little difficult to, to land on because of perception. He wants to make sure um, that, uh, I think this is Fitz Fulton was flying it. Uh, they had absolutely outstanding uh, heavy test pilots there. And he's coming back in to land, and the thing you don't want to do is have this thing, you know, you land so hard, or, you know, hardly any sink rate that it releases and it's going to tear that wing off and this is going to be a really big disaster and my shift had ended the the new guy replacing me come in and i briefed him on the mission and then i got in the uh uh the car and i went down next to the base uh with the uh the uh, ops officer there uh we got together and went down there to to watch this landing and it's probably one of the most beautiful landings of a b-52 uh i have ever seen so he, uh, he, he does just an absolutely uh, great landing, uh, rolls out very nicely, no problems. They come and secure the aircraft and, uh, um, you know, as best they could, they, they determined that it was safe to taxi. And of course he taxis very slowly. So he went back uh, to NASA and they, they took care of the issue. Of course, now that aircraft is in the museum out there at Edwards. You can see it. Uh, a very historic aircraft, uh, like a lot of them that I was involved in uh, flying with out there are now in museums. But this was uh, a, a very interesting time, and I was just impressed at how quickly uh, NASA and the quality of the pilots and how quickly they could respond uh, to an emergency. And uh, I'd, I'd never seen anybody taxi an aircraft like that in five minutes. It wasn't setting on alert. Um, it was pretty amazing. So, hey, thanks for watching. I hope you uh, found it enjoyable, interesting, informative, and whatever. Thanks.